there. Last week, we concluded a three-part series on the future of gaming. This episode, I'd like to cover a few thoughts on what was discussed, as well as elaborate further on some ideas which didn't make it into the series. Let's start with the one topic that's been getting the most press lately. Virtual Reality What you might not know is VR isn't new. The first real attempt at computer virtual reality was called the Sword of Damocles in 1968 at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. It was called that because it was so big and heavy that it had to be suspended from the ceiling. It was also the first real attempt at augmented reality. Being that it was 1968, the graphics were very limited and required a lot of computing power. It took 30 years to finally get to where we are now with the Oculus Rift. HTC Vive, and all other competing VR headsets that are coming out of the woodwork. Since the release of the episode, we've learned that NVIDIA is also working on their own VR headset. Also, PlayStation VR can in theory do full room VR like the HTC Vive. Most of the headsets will also work with non-VR games. Steam VR will put you in a virtual theater with non-VR games occupying a large virtual screen. PlayStation VR with non-VR games is described as playing on an IMAX sized screen. What we didn't mention in the episode is that many of these VR headsets use APIs that aren't all compatible with one another. Each have their own separate software software development kits. The license for the Oculus Rift bars other headset makers from using their SDK to make their headsets compatible with the Oculus unless they have permission first. The Steam VR license for the Vive is reportedly compatible with the Oculus license, and Steam VR is open source whereas the Oculus SDK is not. Good news is, many games that support Oculus Rift also support the Vive. Some are Oculus only, however. The lack of a compatibility standard accepted by all headsets might hold VR back until the various manufacturers can hammer one out. So, expect a platform war, for the first year, or longer with the Oculus and Vive being the two heaviest hitters. Conspicuously quiet on the subject of VR is Microsoft. They have the HoloLens augmented reality headset, but gamers on the Xbox One will be looking for a VR experience. Right now it isn't known if they'll follow Sony and make a VR headset for Xbox and Windows 10. Plenty of headsets that use cell phones, or are their own self-contained Android-powered computing platforms are also in development. For gamers excited about virtual reality, the next few years are going to be an amazing time. One more thing. We mentioned that a powerful computer would be required to power VR. That could change as some headset makers are looking into APIs that adjust game settings so older computers can also use VR. On that note, Sony has released strict requirements for PlayStation VR games. Anything that cannot maintain a steady 60 to 90 frame per second rate or drops frames won't be certified. This is because high frame rates are absolutely vital to preventing motion sickness when using VR, so Sony is being very heavy handed on this for a good reason. If too many people get sick using PlayStation VR it could fail, and this is why the Oculus and Vive also require such high system requirements. Otherwise. Virtual reality might become just a short footnote in gaming history as just another fad that didn't catch on. A lot of money has been invested into virtual reality, so the companies involved have a lot to lose if VR fails. The topic of episode 2 generated a lot of hate when discussed in other forums and communities, usually among fanboys who feel threatened by any change in the status quo. That episode discussed the convergence of PCs and game consoles, a very polarizing subject in the gaming community. Console fanboys and the PC master race crown feel very threatened by change on both sides. Those who are the most outspoken against Steam machines and console form factor PCs are the enthusiasts, people who invest upwards of $1,000 or more into their computers. The convergence of consoles and PCs won't kill off the PC enthusiast market. In fact, while Dell and other branded PC manufacturers have been seeing sales drop, the PC enthusiast market has seen unprecedented growth. Overall, 
PC gaming revenue morphs the console market. Fanboys use the defense that most of that revenue comes from free-to-play games and MOBAs, but those are still PC games. It doesn't change the fact that PC gaming is still a much bigger market than console gaming. And, now, Microsoft's universal Windows platform means all first-party, and some third-party games released for the Xbox One will also be released on Windows 10. There have been issues with Universal App Games. The Universal App Platform is a walled garden. Universal App Games can't be modded. You don't have access to the executable file, so programmable gaming keyboards and mice won't work with them. That same restriction prevents recording with programs like Fraps and Open Broadcaster which need access to the executable to work. You can also forget launching Universal App Games from Steam, and anything that puts in overlay in games. Also, SLI and Crossfire currently don't work for Universal App Games, and until just recently NVIDIA's G-Sync technology also didn't work. The PC gaming community had very legitimate reasons for being extremely upset. Games released as Universal Apps had a number of other strange limitations, which scared PC enthusiasts. Microsoft has a well-deserved bad reputation. While the company is trying to change its ways, the legacy of Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer continues to haunt them. Especially with PC gamers, the company has a serious image problem, and this is a major barrier to gaining people's trust. It doesn't help that many developers are reluctant to speak out against the Universal Windows platform, and those that do quickly retract their statements, basically. It makes it look bad, and so you can understand why most PC gamers still don't trust Microsoft. Microsoft has released statements saying they are working to address these issues, but they have a very steep uphill battle ahead of them. Their image is the biggest obstacle. The layoffs that came after Balmer's exit didn't help their image. And, they still demand licensing fees for Android based on patents that are now public domain. That last one will continue to haunt every effort they make to regain the trust of both gamers, and the open source community. The proxy war Microsoft fought against Linux, which completely destroyed SCO is an offense that may never be forgiven. Regardless, it doesn't change what's happening with consoles and PCs converging. While the enthusiast market continues to grow, small form factor PCs are also growing in popularity. PCs small enough and quiet enough to fit in home entertainment centers. On the other side, the days of buying game console every 5 to 10 years could be coming to an end. Both Sony and Microsoft want to make their consoles upgradable. Microsoft has released statements to this fact, and Sony is preparing to release an updated PS4. This is likely a move to help PlayStation VR, but a console that can be upgraded works in their favor. Game console development costs a lot of money, and it costs game developers a lot of time and money to adjust to new hardware. A system that can be upgraded every few years rather than completely replaced is far more cost effective. It would also eliminate one of the biggest drawbacks to console gaming, a lack of real backward compatibility. Fanboys will argue that consoles have that now, but it's only a half-truth. One, backward compatibility on the PS4 is done via PS Now, a streaming service not unlike on Live. The games don't run on a console, but on a remote server. And two, backward compatibility on the Xbox One is limited to a few select games. You can't take just any Xbox 360 game, put in your Xbox One, and play it. For each game Microsoft has to tailor a custom virtual machine profile to run it, so only certain games are being given backward compatibility. And, that's if the game studio gives Microsoft permission. Upgradable consoles would stop the nonsense. Backward compatibility on consoles would work the way it does on PCs today. How many other platforms do you know of that can play 20 plus year old games? It should be noted that not everything on PC is 100% backward compatible, and those that don't work are few and far between. MS-DOS games are probably the most common, but DOSBox pretty much eliminates that problem. There is also VirtualBox, which is free, and can run native MS and PC DOS so you can run old games easily. This gives the PC a game library that dwarfs all of the game consoles combined. 30 plus years of PC games are still playable one way or another. That's an overwhelming number. 
This is what console gamers look forward to having if they never had to buy a new machine, but simply upgraded their existing one for 10, 20, or even 30 years. Eventually, some really old games might not work anymore, but that's been true on PCs for a long time now. But, consider the lifespan of those games would be much longer than the lifespan of games for the Xbox, Xbox 360, PS2 and PS3. Then, you have PCs becoming more like consoles interface-wise. There is Steam Big Picture, which is designed to work with a game controller. Valve's Steam controller has been earning a lot of fans. Now that more people have been trying it, they finally see its benefits. The controller was designed first and foremost to address the problem that most Steam games don't support controllers at all. For those that do, it emulates an Xbox controller. The 6-axis motion control is very helpful for aiming in first-person shooters, and many people playing Call of Duty and Battlefield on PC using a Steam controller have been holding their own well against traditional mouse and keyboard users. This is something traditional controllers could never accomplish. The analog sticks for aiming just aren't accurate enough, but the touchpads and motion controls on the Steam controller are. When the right pad is configured as a joystick mouse, the level of control you get blows traditional dual analog game pads away. It doesn't work perfectly for every game, but for all those that do it's incredible. Valve has done what many thought was impossible, find something that can surpass the keyboard and mouse for playing PC games. This opens the door to playing a lot of PC games on the couch, without needing funky setups that clutter up the living room, just so you can still use a keyboard and mouse. Also, having a PC in your living room lets you use Media Center software that supports a far larger number of video and audio formats than game consoles and set-top boxes. Might many of these formats also come to game consoles eventually? It is possible, as their hardware improves and the console makers continue to upgrade their operating systems. None of this, absolutely none of this, means that PC enthusiasts can still build their epic gaming rigs with custom water cooling loops. It simply means that PC's been become more accessible to players who might not have gotten into PC gaming before. Fanboys on both sides will be mad, because it means they'll have to learn to share the playground. And, that's a good thing. The last episode talked about the changing definitions of what makes a game. In recent years we've started seeing games that defy, or just don't fit into any one specific genre. The idea of what a game should be, or can be is evolving. For a long time games have been limited to only certain genre. These have been limited on game consoles because their controllers often aren't amenable to every kind of game type. That never stopped some developers from trying. A few rare exceptions have been StarCraft for the N64, and SimCity on the Super NES. Then, you have games that break from the status quo and try new things. Games that don't involve shooting everything that wiggles, but instead make you think and touch your heart in some way. Some of these take elements of existing genre, then change the formula in radical new ways. They're games that prove you don't need guns and big explosions to have a good time. Talking to the fourth wall again, I've been covered the subject of our three-part series with our viewers, and touching a little more on each of them. Right now we're talking about games which defy accepted norms, like games without fighting, or where the aim of the game isn't to shoot everything in sight. That's part of it, but it's not exclusive to that. Games can be so much more than just blowing things up. Those can be fun, but so can games where you don't kill anything, or the focus isn't on killing. Those really aren't anything new, somewhat. A lot of these new games are coming from developers who are reimagining what a game can be. That Dragon Cancer is one good example, which we gave in episode 3. You didn't mention her story, a story about my uncle, Among the Sleep, and others like it. No, we didn't, and we should have. Another is the Unfinished Swan, but the ones we mentioned were more well known and meant to give the best examples of what we were talking about. Games where the main premise doesn't involve fighting is an example of what direction some evolving. Another, a game that combines genre and news ways, like this No Man's Sky, that I keep hearing about everywhere I look. That's just one example, and there are more games similar to it on the way.
one called Astronier takes the concept and brings in a little more Minecraft into the mix. It's also a completely procedurally generated game. No texture files were used. Every texture in the game was generated on the fly, that's how Spore worked. Don't get me started about Spore. That game had so much potential and Electronic Arts completely ruined it. Spore should have been Will Wright's magnum opus, but instead it ended his career as a game designer. The game he continually showed the public, and what we finally got were totally different. EA, wanting something to appeal to a broader audience, turned it into a casual game. They ruined Will Wright's vision, so a game that should have been one of the most unique and amazing ever made was simply mediocre. The rise of indie studios changes this. Yes, you'll never see these new, innovative games come from the likes of EA, Activision, or Ubisoft, but from indie studios. They have the ability to innovate and try crazy new ideas which are transforming the world of gaming. No Man's Sky and Astro Nier are both from indie studios. Star Citizen, yet another game that takes multiple genres and meshes them together in a new way, is also an indie game. On top of that, it is a crowd-funded game. Possibly the biggest and most ambitious ever attempted. It's taking a long time to develop, but that's because the game is that big, that complex. It's the kind of dream game people have been wishing they could play someday, and soon they'll be able to. This is the evolution of gaming. New ideas once thought impossible becoming reality because there are people out there now who have the talent and will to make it happen. Because of this evolution, the AAA studios will be left in the dust. They look like dinosaurs in comparison to what's coming. We are entering video games third golden age. Basically, it's an incredible time to be a gamer. Precisely. And, that concludes our recap and discussion on the future of gaming. That series was a real labor of love and we hope you enjoyed it. A new show is coming in April called Q&A with Mike. Mike will take gaming, tech, and geek culture questions from the community, and do his best to answer them in a way that's easy to understand. It will be a monthly show, and will feature the best questions submitted by the community in both Gamers Bay and on YouTube. The deadline for submitting questions for the show is April 3rd. So, you still have time to submit them either in the comments section below or in the Q&A with Mike thread on Gamers Bay. As the professor says, the only bad questions are those never asked. So, feel free to start posting whatever questions you can think of. The best will be compiled and answered on the show by Mike on camera. Until next time, I've been Chloe Nightshade. See you next week.